within this beautiful city, which is the fastest growing urban area in the world, economically speaking. There was a recent report in December which suggested that Bangalore was the economic powerhouse, not only of Karnataka state, not, not only of India, but, but the world itself. And you know that every city runs on one engine, and one of the most crucial engines is water. And my story with you today, which I want to share, is about water and Bangalore and the historical connections that there are. The stories in the media, this was in 2018, was pretty frightening and alarming. Since 11 cities most likely to run out of drinking water, Sao Paulo was one, and Bangalore was number two. The Niti Ayo, which is a government think tank, also put Bangalore as a city to reach zero groundwater levels, and overall affecting access to about 100 million people. This is an international organization, this is a national organization, putting in a pretty dismal picture for, for, for our city. So one wants to ask, why is this happening? And it's very interesting because I've been working in Bangalore's water sector for the last 30 years. Fascinating. Here's our city in pink there. This is the Kaveri Basin. There's two dams, the KRS Dam near Mysore and the Kaveri Reservoir. These are the two reservoirs which hold water, release it into the river from here and here, comes to a place called Tarekad in Haldi, near Kanakura. From there it's popped up to the city of Bangalore, up 300 meters and a distance of nearly 100 kilometers making it one of Asia's most costliest water, most energy-embedded water. It takes two units of energy to get a thousand liters of water to all city, and the water with the most carbon emissions. But this is a remarkable engineering feat to get water from 100 kilometers and 300 meters below the city. It's a remarkable engineering feat. So this is the dependence of the city on one single source, the Kaveri, for its water. But is that true? And why is it that it is? So here's fascinating things for me. Those of you who have been to the Lalba would have seen the big rock on which the Kempegora Tower is. This history is about 3,500 million years. The rock itself is 3,500 million years. Peninsula of Nice. That rock and the volcanic eruption and the stabilization has caused Bangor to be at 920 meters above sea level, which gives it this wonderful climate. The rock also tells us what's happening below the ground. Weathering zone has happened on top, soil has been created, something called weathered rock has been created. This acts like a sponge that holds water, and deep below is hard rock that we drill for our bore wells, sometimes find water and sometimes don't, and we've gone to a depth of 1,800 feet. Our old people have carved inscription stones and hero stones, Viragalus as they're called, and inscription stones. They tell us stories about what's happening in the city for more than 1,200 years, and it's all been carved from this rock, peninsula maze. And then another interesting phenomenon happens, and this has got everything to do with water of Bangalore. India, about 88 million years ago, or about 90 million years ago, maybe 100 million years ago, decided to separate from Madagascar, the small island on the coast of, off the coast of Africa, and decided to drift up to join the Asian subcontinent, the continental drift. We're moving at about two and a half centimeters a year. India is pushing itself into Asia and creating the Himalayas, as you know. But there's an interesting story here. When India moved away from Madagascar, it left a piece of what's called the Western Guards in Madagascar. And that piece of the Western Guards is called the Palghat Gap. Somebody's traveling from Coimbatore to Kerala, your bus and your train goes through something called the Palghat Gap on its way to Palghat. This gap in the Western Guards is about 30 kilometers wide. The gap means that the Western Guards have sunk and is about 300 meters at that point of time. What has that got to do with Bangalore? In the months of April and May, when the whole of India is sweltering under summer, the air gets hot over Bangalore and rises up. And through the Palghat Gap, rushes in humid winds from the Arabian Sea, drifts up in the afternoon and comes to Bangalore, and we get the famous rains called the office rains of Bangalore in April and May at 5 or 5.30 in the evening when you can't leave your college and go home, or you can't leave your office and go home. And this means that Bangalore, third rainiest month is May, which is the hottest time for the rest of India. And April also gets about 46 millimeters of rainfall. Very important for the city, this rain. This rain was understood by our old people, as I showed you in the inscription stones. And they built the keres and the bavis, the keres, kuntes, and kattes, the lakes, tanks that we know of, 
to hold and harvest the rainwater, infiltrate into the ground, become filtered water, and come from these beautiful wells to be used for drinking and domestic purpose. This is the story of water linked to continental drift and linked to a plateau which was formed three and a half thousand million years back. But who are the people who built these lakes and tanks? There's a community called the Wadda, the Manwadda of the old community. These people have been digging wells and tanks across India for more than a thousand years. They're an itinerant community. They migrate from place to place. They all the way from Rajasthan and Kashmir in the north to Tamil Nadu. This community has various names. The state of Odisha itself may have come from this community. community Odisha. Od or what is to break. They broke the earth and made these tanks and lakes. And they're still around. This community is still around. If you find a name called Vadda Palya or Bobi Palya, it's these people who occupy those spaces. But they're a forgotten community. Muniapa, Ramkrishna, Shankar. These are names which are forgotten. About 750 to 1,000 families in and around Bangalore still dig wells. But because of the era of bore wells, they don't have a job. And this city is riddled with open wells. I'm not talking about bore wells. Open dug wells, you know. Pottery Town, Cotton Pig, Basmanguri, Yalahanka, Sanjay Nagar, these names are very familiar to Bangaloreans. All these places have open wells with water even now, like this. This water was what served the city for more than a thousand years with the coming of the Kaveri water supply. And this is the forgotten water that we need to tap back if we want to avoid the scarce scenarios the Niti Aayog and BBC puts up. How is that to be done? It's a simple thing. Grab the rainfall that falls on the rooftop. Push it down. This blue drum is a filter. It's a filter of sand and gravel. And allow it to go into the well. This is an open well there. Allow it to percolate into the ground. Mr. Balsubramaniam has done that. His well gives him all the water he requires for the whole year. That's another example out there. These wells are two feet and three feet in diameter, about 20 feet deep. You're putting rooftop rainwater from the pipes into them, making sure that you're harvesting rainwater and recharging the aquifer. And if you're in certain zones of the city, the water then becomes available to you. If we do a million wells for Bangalore, we will never have a water shortage. That's our plan. So where is all this happening? If you go to Kabul Park and enjoy the ambience and the environment of the place, do spend time to figure out but there are seven beautiful old open wells which we have forgotten about, which the Manwadas gave life to. And this is the water level in the wells at 10 feet even now. And these wells, seven of them, including the famous Karaga Dabadi, where the Karaga festival of Bangalore also takes place, provides about one lakh liters for the park's requirement of water. And then Kabul Park has put in 64 recharge wells, to make sure that all the water that falls in the landscape is pushed into that river, and these wells are full. That's 220 acres for you. Another example, close by the wheel and axle plant of the railways. They had forgotten that there were four large, beautiful old open wells around the wetland. They were dumping garbage and slag around that place. Once they realized that this pressure was there with them, they just had to clear away that garbage and slag, restore the wetland, make sure the rainwater comes to the wetland there, and the wells now give them three lakh liters of water. They don't have to depend on the BWSSB or the Kaveri for a drop of water. All the water requirements come from wells and rainwater harvesting. There's a famous institution, the Indian Institute of Management in Bangalore. They have put about 60 recharge wells, picking water from stormwater drains, leading them to these wells, which are about 20 to 30 feet deep, making sure the water infiltrates into the ground. And their bore wells now give them much better water than what they used to do before. Large campuses can do recharge at a scale. How are these wells made? How are these recharge wells made? Here's a manwater digging down into the soil using implements which are hand operated. They dig about three or four feet in diameter and go 20, 30, 40 feet, but typically 20 to 25 feet. Then they use precast concrete rings which are made on the side on the side of roads. These rings are lowered into the pit one at a time, and when one ring is lowered, you pack it with gravel on the side and then you put in the next ring. And finally, you put a grill or a concrete slab cover to make sure it's safe and secure. And then you lead storm water into this well. And when you leave the storm water or the rooftop in water, as you see, the water can come back in many of these wells. It's a simple process. A team of well diggers of four or five can dig a well in a day. They dig a well in a day. And so that's the kind of output productivity they have. So, how then should wells be imagined in the future? How should we imagine groundwater? This is a classic example of a layout called Rainbow Drive, which does not have connections to the city water utility. 
which means there are 360 sites here or plots. Each one of them would have dug a bore well, spending two lakh rupees, going 900 feet, 360 straws into the same Coca-Cola bottle, trying to empty it. Yes, and pretty soon all of it dry. So how do you reverse the process? by banning private borewells, by putting three community borewells, sharing the water, by putting in 360 blue recharge wells. Everybody takes responsibility to fill water in. Everybody takes collective responsibility to share whatever they filled in in an equitable manner, and to put a cap on demand, to use as much water as you've actually put it into the ground or less, so that you're stable. What Rainbow Drive has then achieved is water sustainability at a 36-acre scale. Apartments are also growing here. TZ is an apartment which is close to Vastu. They've done something remarkable. They've not only put 40 recharge wells to put all the rainwater into the ground, but they treat their wastewater, and this is the first community in India which actually blends their treated wastewater with good groundwater, and as you see, they drink it. So this is the kind of pioneering approach that Bangalore has shown, and communities have shown, which we need to scale up if you have to address the water problem that, that they have. And as local communities are working on reviving lakes, like this one called Kaikonderhalli, downstream of it, large wells are coming back to life. And these wells now provide water to apartments, where ironically, in the same apartment, the bore well is dry, but the open well is providing water. Because of the geology of Bangalore, in many places, the open well is not connected to the bore well. The surface water, the surface aquifer is easier to recharge. The deep aquifer is more difficult. And as we work towards reviving our lakes, or shallow open well should come back more and more to life. And everywhere, the Manwedders participate, Vedana, Shankar, Ramakrishna, the teams that they are, they participate in cleaning these old open wells, desilting them, bringing them back to life, digging new ones, recharging them. And the treasure which they are finding in these wells is not necessarily old coins, but actually the water that is there in the well. And the water is more precious than any gold or diamond or anything that you can think of. This is what the well diggers are able to achieve through the million through the million wells program. All they ask for is more work. Provide us work so that we earn a livelihood to bring up our family, to educate our children, to be able to make sure that the children have a brighter future and that the city has water security. We need a compact, a partnership between these traditional well diggers and the citizens of this great city of ours and put in place a million wells to recharge rainwater so that our younger generation and us become groundwater literate, water literate, and permanently avoid any chance of water scarcity. So this is the compact, this is the vision, not I have, but what the Manwatas have for the city of Bangalore, linking geology, time, livelihoods, and history with the present and the future to make things sustainable. Let's join this journey. Thank you.